Check, check, check. Okay, doke. I'm gonna get started here in a sec. Hi, friends. How you doing? I am Jen Vega. Welcome back to Attack the Pantry. This stream is a deep dive into ingredients, cooking techniques, and recipes to help you cook for yourself during quarantine and, well, the rest of your adult life. Uh, last time on Attack the Pantry, we talked about strawberries, stinging nettles, and gailan, which is Chinese broccoli. Uh, you can watch all the previous clips and highlights here on the channel if you click on the videos link above or below me. I don't know how Twitch is laid out for you anymore these days. Um, but since Twitch deletes the streams every two weeks, I will be uploading all the archive to youtube.com slash J-E-N-N-D-L-V after every stream. So you can check that later on tonight, and it will be there. And, you know, in case you miss this or in case it's gone. I don't know. Time travel. Um, make sure to subscribe there if you can't uh, watch at my regular times. Right? Right. Uh, so I was live on Sunday at noon. Every Sunday at noon, I uh, read a bunch of zines. That stream is called Zine Dreams. Uh, we looked at Put an Egg on at number 11, which we accidentally skipped over because I did 12 last week like an idiot. Um, we also talked extensively about air travel and like what that, you know, how, what we think about it right now and like what we remember of, from it, um, from Dean Putney's Sky Zine, which is a 10 year collection of window seat photos. It's very, very fascinating and brought up a lot of memories for a lot of us. And we also looked at Edible Brooklyn's good meat issue, um, which was enlightening. Uh... What else? So there are lots of important links down below this video. Uh, if you could share those during the stream, after the stream, or whatever, it helps spread the word and gets more people to come in here and like enjoy the party and learn. 
That would be nice. Um, if you have an Amazon Prime account, you can connect it to Twitch and a gift a subscription to your favorite creators every month. Hope one of them is me. Um, and you get a little crown next to your name in the chat, which is really sweet. Just like Lucius here. Hi, Lucius. <laughs> How are you? Um, okay. So what has been happening this week? Um, uh, Monday, new skate video. There's 17 of them already. Uh, they're gonna change format after this week, I think. Yeah, they're gonna change format after this week. And, um, it's really strange to rewatch these because, uh, I'm a month ahead. So, I'm actually skating in real time, like, the videos are a month behind me actually skating, so I've improved, like, 150% since those videos, so <laughs> it's really weird to, like, watch it and be like, oh, yeah, I stand much better now. But anyway, um, progress. Um, we have a new Fun City episode publishing every day this week, so usually it's every other Friday, but um, this is our last episode. It's sort of a mega week-long episode where you follow each character um, for a day. And so on Monday, we followed Lux around, um, and he visited a few people and went shopping. Uh, yesterday, we followed Lash to an urban brawl game, which is sort of like street rugby in the future. And today, instead of part part three, we decided to put a, a bonus e episode of, um, our discussion about what social media looks like in the year 2101. Um, it's really fascinating and really interesting to think about. Um, I wonder, you know, how far off are we from it? Um, and there's some really, like, I don't know, mo like, really interesting moments. Because we recorded that conversation in 2019. And um, there's a moment where Shannon suggests, like, what if there's a social network for people who have, like, a disease? And I, I was like, oh, my God, when I was re-listening to it. Uh, what if there's, like, a COVID app? I don't know. Anyway, we're going to resume uh, the episode tomorrow where we follow TK, uh, where he goes uptown. And then Friday, we follow Viv, who is my character, to Central Park. And I, wow, like listening to these episodes again, I can't believe I get to do this and I get to have fun with my friends. It's, it's a, an amazing show. Uh, I really care about our characters, and I care about the game, and I can't wait to get back into the studio, but for now, you know, we're recording, um, Still Fleet starting next week, or, yeah, starting next week, uh, so, we can look forward to that. Lots, lots of stuff happening, lots of stuff happening, um, let's see, uh, on Patreon, I have a patron-only Netflix party tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Eastern. We're gonna start season one of Ugly Delicious. You need a Netflix account and Netflix party extension to join the chat. Um, I also shared a recipe this week for collard green wraps, and then today, strawberry mustarda, which I showed you on the stream last week. Um, Gonna launch Culinary Word of the Day tomorrow. It is already up on, on um, Stitcher, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Uh, but just kind of doing the bigger splashy, like, hey, we're live tomorrow. Um, I've just been openly saying it on the stream because, you know, you guys are very special. Um, yeah, so I've got a couple episodes recorded of that. I'm really excited to get it going. If you want to suggest words for that podcast, you can go to the Twitter account, Culinary W-O-T-D, and there's a form pinned to the top, and you can suggest culinary words um, that you want to learn about or that you want people to know about, like, especially if you grew up in a different culture or, like, you're not American. Like, we would love to hear your culinary words. Um, yeah, I want to learn more. Uh, what else, what else, what else, what else? Uh, there's lots of stuff. Lots of links below. Check them out. Let's just move on to looking at what y'all cooked. Let's see. What we got here? Uh, this is, I think, Dylan. Dylan's pasta. Chicken and, and spinach there. See that powdered parmesan? There's nothing wrong with powdered parmesan. Did you all hear that um, controversy like a year or two ago about um, some parmesan cheese manufacturers putting wood wood dust in their cheese? Scary. Just make sure you eat all the ingredients or 
or always grate your parmesan fresh from a block. That probably tastes that you know it tastes the best anyway. <laughs> uh, uh, what else? Oh, uh, happy birthday to my Aunt Grace, uh, who was standing in line at Acme Bread in San Francisco. Cute. Um, my friend Sam, this is not your typical food submission. Uh, I usually post pictures of food on the stream, but Sam is a great chef and friend of mine uh, who is also making jewelry. And so she made this, like, tiny, 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 like kitchen set so that she can display the um, jewelry that she's making like how cute is that oh I can't wait I can't wait to see the jewelry <laughs> uh, we got an egg and noodle here I think this is Vance's oh my brother my brother even sent me something this is my brother's pork belly um, what's it called eggs Benedict look at that look at that Perfect egg. Let's scroll up and look at that egg. Look at that egg drip. Good job, brother. We also got... Oh! Martin went pee-picking. <laughs> this is in Santa Cruz. Our friend Robin has uh, an amazing backyard and garden, and he got to pick um, peas, like, fresh from the vine. Isn't that nice? What else? Oh, uh, Vanessa. This is really funny. Uh, my friends are discovering um, my lion's mane mushroom recipe on my website because they're just starting to cook with it more. And when you Google lion's mane mushroom or how to cook lion's mane mushroom, my website is one of the top results. <laughs> and so Vanessa was like, I was trying to figure out how to make um, lion's mane mushroom. And then like, look who I saw. And so she sent me this picture of her, um, her pasta. It's like a carbonara. Lion's Mane Carbonara, is that nice? Mmm. The secret to Lion's Mane Mushroom is uh, cooking it off enough that it doesn't have a medicinal taste uh, and has a texture of uh, chicken or like lobster. Yeah. But you have to be careful about not heating it up, uh, you're not burning it because it's a, it's very, it has a lot of water and it can, it can burn very easily. Um, but you still want to get that medicinal taste out. So I recommend low and slow and then um, bring it up to crisp up the edges at the end. Yeah. Yeah, solid goop. Agreed. What else? Oh, Joe sent this fried chicken video. I was like, so proud of you. He didn't tell me what he was making with this. I hope it's like a chicken farm. I could watch that all day, couldn't you? Like, oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh no. What did I do this week? Let's see. I got plants. Oh. Um. So, as a thank you from the tank. So it's like an organization that I'm on the board of. Um, I catered the gala this year, like we had a virtual gala and I hosted a cooking segment for everybody before the actual show so that everybody could eat w together. <laughs> it was really cute. And the tank sent me these lovely succulents and air plants, like I've never had an air plant before. Um, this one's named Live. This one is named Miso. And then this one is named Tropo. <laughs> Are they adorable? Ah, these are hanging above my couch. Love it. I never would have like outright bought air plants for myself, but they're very low maintenance. You um, spritz them once a day and then uh, soak them in water uh, once a week. So hopefully they don't die. <laughs> uh, I made tomato soup and a grilled cheese the other day because I was feeling real bad. I don't know, I just having one of those days where I was like, nap all day. And I was like, what's a comfort food? Tomato soup and grilled cheese. When's the last time you had a, a tomato soup and grilled cheese? You should make some. Um, ooh, this was fun. This is, so I went to Flushing Chinatown on my way back from strawberry picking last week. 
and uh, I picked up like a box. I actually I'll get it to show you. I got a box of these pandan flavored um, mini rolls. They're like ho hos, but uh, pandan flavored. So like pandan is like a leaf, like an Asian leaf. We could talk about that on another stream, but um, these are like ho hos. <laughs> And so I cut them up and put um, marshmallow frosting in between the layers and then strawberries uh, to make a trifle. So this that's what's behind me right now. It's very satisfying. I might make another one tonight. <laughs> did I use fresh tomato in the soup? I did. I, well, I did um, a trifecta. I did crushed canned tomato, a little bit, a tablespoon of tomato paste, and then one fresh tomato. And that was enough for... I would say two servings. Yeah. And then there's a little cream at the end with marjoram and uh, parsley and there's one more herb. Tarragon. <laughs> Lots of good herbs in there. What else? Ooh, I had this yesterday. Um, so I made risotto last week and then, uh, I, you know, I can't finish anything. I can't finish anything. I made like risotto for two people. So I, I made risotto cakes uh, and fried them uh, with the leftovers. And on top we have the strawberry chutney that I showed you last week and some dill. So it's nice and crunchy. I ate four of these. It's great. Um, so this is some sad news. Xi'an Famous Foods is closing their location in Greenpoint. Um, they're not going out of business. They're just um, focusing on, um, I guess, bigger foot traffic, uh, more popular areas. Um, they're still doing mail order uh, hand pulled noodle kits and um, chili sauce ordering over over the mail, like so you can you can get their sauce mailed to you. But um, as a tribute, I made their uh, a version of their tiger salad. Like so, their tiger salad has. Um, leeks and scallions and cilantro with celery, but I don't have a lot of those things. So I did celery, salad greens, dill, and chili with rice vinegar. And instead of cilantro, I have ground coriander. You can see like a little bit of dusting there on top. You know, it's not the same, but uh, you know, it's, it's nice, a little tribute. It's this, this salad is like perfect with like spicy stuff and like a good summer, summer cooling crunch with a tiny bit of spice. But yeah, if you want to Google tiger salad, um, there's a bunch of recipes online for it. You can try it. Yeah. Does sound comfy, doesn't it? I've been obsessed, obsessed with uh, molasses milk. <laughs> I've been testing a, a cookbook this past month, and one of the recipes was like um, a toffee treacle drink. And uh, I've just been making them every morning. So I make a strong tea and then uh, line the glass with a little condensed milk and then line the glass with some um, molasses. That's the brown part. And then I take my half and half and shake it and then add like a foam layer on top. So it's like my lovely little milk tea. <laughs> it's fun. Looks dope, doesn't it? Yeah. What else? Uh, for dinner one night, I had a bacon wrapped hot dog with the strawberry chutney. I'll get that view here. And some dill. Look at that hot dog. Hot dog. Oh, this was a huge accomplishment, and we're going to talk about this later. Uh, I've never made a lattice pie before. Like, all the pie crusts I've ever bought, you know come from a freezer like I've never I mean I've made it from scratch but I've always just put the full sheet over the pie and like be done with it like <laughs> this is like the kind of baking that stresses me out and like why I'm not a baker but um I don't know I did a lot of research and and did it like look at it it doesn't look like crap <laughs> this is a beef tongue savory pie um and the crust uh, we'll talk about that later, is the flakiest I've ever had in my life. Um, it was extremely satisfying. Uh, it did take three days to make this pie. Not because of the crust, but because of the filling. Um, <laughs> but this is what it looked like at the end. I was really proud of this. Like, patience, everyone. 
Like, you can do it too. It does look difficult, but it actually is not very hard. Um, so, what you do, after you master making pie crust, which is what we'll talk about later, uh, the secret, really, is to keep putting the crust back in the fridge. It needs to be cold as hell for you to be able to, to move it around and weave it like this. And so, like, you see these, like, dots on the left? That's actually a cover-up. Like, you're supposed to put down, like, your all vertical strings. So say that I, I have all my strings that are going horizontally across the pan. I have those spaced out. They're all, I, I pinch them to the edges. And then I lift up every other one and then uh, put a vertical one in. Put those back down, lift the opposite, <laughs> you know. And uh, you just go down the whole length of the loaf like that. And then you cover up the ugly edges with, with cutouts. <laughs> That's what I did. <laughs> Wasn't that bad. <laughs> so what else? Oh, I posted this one on Instagram. This is when a salmon sandwich smiles back at you. Like, I had just a really good light that day. Look at that. That is um, ramp yogurt, salad greens with flowers, and acme fish, lemon pepper, salmon on ore washers, multigrain bread. Very satisfying. What else? Oh, I gave a talk during Jen Schiffer's Live Laugh Con yesterday. <laughs> If you go to her account, you can, um, <laughs> Jen Schiffer on Twitter, if you can go to her account, um, you can, you can find my talk. I might upload it to YouTube later, but, uh, where is it? Here, you can see, live, laugh, conf. Live, laugh, dot blog is her, her new blog. She hosted this event, um, to launch her blog, her lifestyle blog. <laughs> it's very funny. Okay, let's move on. Friends, how are you? Martin, you gotta go pick up your CSA later. <laughs> All right, today, 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 we're gonna talk about tuna, origins of tuna. We're gonna talk about uh, watercress, and then pie crust, because nobody asked about pie crust, but I did. I asked about pie crust. I just uh, was thinking about it so much this week that I really needed to share, share that knowledge. Uh. Okay, let's talk about tuna. Actually, let's put an egg on me first and then let's talk about tuna. Ah, poached egg. Okay, in Polynesian mythology, did you know tuna is the god of eels? <laughs> he was sentenced to be executed after trying to sexually assault a god named Sina. And uh, he, he asked that his severed head be buried in the sand. And from it, the first coconut palm grew. Damn. I don't know where in Hawaii that is, but that's so brutal. <laughs> Tuna is also the Maori word for um, long fin eel in New Zealand. So you can see that Polynesian, like, you know, that mythology kind of goes over to New Zealand too. Interesting. Um, so a tuna is a saltwater fish and belongs to the tribe Th Thunini, Thunini. Um, and it's a subgrouping of the mackerel family. So I didn't know that tuna was related to mackerel. So that makes it an oily fish. Great. Um, you might also see it in uh, like European stores labeled as tunny, T-U-N-N-Y. Tuna is found in warm waters. It is extensively fished commercially. It is probably one of the most recognizable fish. Um, so, unfortunately though, some species of tuna are overfished and uh, like the southern bluefin tuna is threatened with extinction. We'll look at the chart later. But, tuna ultimately derives from thunus, which is a middle Latin. Um, for tunny fish, <laughs> tunny fish, uh, which comes from Greek rush or dart along. So tuna are known for like being elusive to catch and like darting around. 
So they're sleek, they're streamlined, uh, they're adapted for speed. Yes, they have two closely spaced dorsal fins on their back. And the first, you know, the first fins are depressible, which means they can be laid down flush with the, with the back so that um, it can slow down and, and create drag in the water if it needs to. But they can also just like make themselves like bullet through the water. It's kind of crazy. I don't think I've ever seen that. Yeah, Lucius. Yeah, tono in Italian. That's true. Yeah, how did tuna become so popular? Um, hopefully. Let, let's see. Uh, after we dig into this a little bit more. I want to show you the tuna charts. Ingredients. So we have a piece of tuna here. This is very recognizable. This is like tuna sashimi, like sushi grade. Let's see. So tuna is split into two groups. So bluefin and yellowfin. Like, obviously, like blue, <laughs> bluefin, because they have blue fins. Um, so these are the most familiar kinds of tuna. So albacore, those are, you know, the ones that we find in a can. You can also find them uh, fresh. You can see that uh, they are near threatened here on this chart. They can get up to 1.4 meters, which is really long. That's... <laughs> meter is like three feet, right? No, it's a yard. <laughs> I don't... Oh wait, 4.6 feet. I'm sorry. Wow, okay, so 1.4 meters is about 4.6 feet. That's like almost as tall as me. That's crazy. Albacore, dang. Um, so I mentioned before the southern bluefin tuna is uh, threatened with extinction. Uh, those can get up to 8 feet long, so critically endangered here. Big eye tuna, they can be 2.5 meters or 8.2 feet long. It says vulnerable, so we're still fishing them. Pacific bluefin, three meters, so 9.8 feet long. Holy crap. Um, and then we have the Atlantic bluefin, which is in currently endangered. So when you're shopping for fish, you'll, you'll know why the prices are, are reflected, you know, and how, how fished they are. Like some of the cheaper fish will be the ones that are like more available you know and so you probably will not see southern bluefin in the store but big eye you will and atlantic bluefin you will yeah interesting they can get really long that's freaky dude um let's see okay so the yellowfin group we have blackfin okay this is like weird why is it called a yellowfin and a blackfin because you can have both you can have a yellow blackfin <laughs> Um, so blackfin can get to 3.6 feet long. Least concern. So there's a lot of these. So yellowfin tuna looks like it's better to eat um, without, you know, uh, endangering the species. So you have long tail and yellowfin. So yellowfin can be almost 8 feet long, dude. Uh, uh, near threatened. I Okay, maybe not yellowfin. So blackfin, long tail. Probably safer to eat. Um, dang. Dang. Yellowfin is also endangered? Wow. Or nearing it endangerment? That's not great. And then there is a special, there's a, not special, other tuna species like slender tuna, bullet tuna, frigate, um, mackerel tuna, little tunny. I'm interested in the little tunny. Black skipjack and skipjack tuna. So it looks like none of these. So it looks like these are probably the better species to eat. And they look younger. Um, the age here, five, five, six, ten years. In the bluefin group, they were getting up to like 40 years, which is probably why they're eight feet long. <laughs> I don't think we get these kinds of tuna over here in New York, at least. Interesting. I'd be curious to find some. Let's see, so back to our tuna here. So unlike most fish, which have like white flesh, the muscle tissue of tuna ranges from pink to dark red. So these red myotomal muscles derive their color from myoglobin, 
oxygen binding molecule, um, which tuna expresses in quantities fi far, far, far higher than most other fish. So the oxygen rich blood further enables energy delivery to their muscles, which also lends to the fact that they are a fast fish. So they're like yoked. <laughs> Real muscular. Yeah. So how do we like to eat tuna, friends? There's sushi, obviously, and sashimi, like the one I'm showing you here. You can have it marinated, like in poke, ceviche, or kinilao, which is the Filipino uh, version of, of ceviche. You can have tuna steaks, just like the one uh, shown above. You can sear them in general when you're searing tuna. I would say 10 seconds on high per side. It can be, you know, like I said, marinated. So you can marinate it in like soy sauce and like some sesame oil, drain it off, and then sear 10 seconds each side, all four sides. <laughs> um, you can put it in, in wraps. You can, uh... oh, this is, like, I'm just talking about the fresh, the fresh stuff. So getting into the canned stuff. So that was first produced in Australia, of all places, in 1903. Um, so it makes sense that there's like Polynesian mythology about tuna and that the first like canned product was in Australia, which is not very far away from there. Um, so this is sort of where it became popular. It wasn't necessarily the fresh fish that was popular. It was the canned tuna. So it was versatile during wartime. Um, it's in edible oils, in brine, in water, and sometimes in like tomato sauce or garlic sauce. Um, so it can be either in a can, it can be solid, chunked, or flaked. So solid, it's gonna be still in like a fillet shape. Chunked, it's like, you know, broken up. And then flaked is with like a fork, like broken apart. So canned light tuna is 29% protein, 8% fat, 60% water, contains no carbs. Wow, no carbs. Um, it provides about 200 calories and 100 gram uh, serving. It's a rich source of phosphorus, vitamin D, and a moderate source of iron. So tuna is actually a great thing during quarantine if you're not going outside very much. Get your vitamin D from it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. So how, do, how can we eat canned tuna? Uh, you can put it in salad, on a salad. You can have it in a tuna melt, in a sandwich. You can have it in a casserole, just like Martin said. Uh, canned tuna, box mac and cheese, yeah. Tuna helper, you can have that. You can have it in a casserole, you can have it in a pasta. Um, canned generally has more hot applications than raw and cold. Um, yeah, how else do you guys like to eat tuna? Meanwhile, here are some more um, lesser known dishes. So, um, let's see, in Indonesia we have kakalang fufu, which is cured and smoked skipjack tuna um, all over a bamboo, like clipped onto a bamboo frame and then like smoked like that. Doesn't that sound fun? <sighs> uh, we have garudia, which is a clear fish broth um, from the Maldives. So the broth is based on um, like the tuna species found over there. Oops, why is my phone? Why'd you stop the music? Don't do it. Here we go. Uh, so, garudia, sorry, clear fish broth um, with tuna in the Maldives. We have gulha, which is another Maldivian snack food. So it's small uh, like tuna dumplings that are stuffed with uh, onion, grated coconut, lime juice, and chili pepper. That sounds great, except for the coconut part. Huh. My friend Isha has a recipe for tuna cutlets, which is like, um, you know, fish fillet kind of fried thing. Uh, what else? There's lots of dishes in the Maldives for some reason. So kandu kukulu, which is a tuna curry. Uh, la 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 la. Fish, another fish curry, mas riha, R-I-H-A, riha. Riha kuru, Mal Maldivian thick food paste um, that's made by the pro byproduct of processing tuna. Okay. Uh, traditionally in France, we have salad niçoise. How many of you have had a salad niçoise? 
Yeah. Yeah, Martin. Yeah. Lucius likes having seared tuna slices on top of a green salad. Yeah, I agree. That's great. Uh, you also make dashi from bonito bits in little bags. I also do that too. Yeah, dashi is great. Um, in Japan, we have tekkadon, T-E-K-K-A-D-O-N. So it's a type of donburi, which is a rice dish. Um, so tekkadon is topped with thinly sliced raw tuna sashimi. Um, and then in Basque country, we have tuna pot called marmatico or marmita. Uh, and it's a fish stew uh, eaten in the Cantabrian Sea. That's fun. Wow. Um, and then another note about fishing in general. So I got to visit the the uh, fish auction in Hawaii a couple years ago. And um, the head of sort of the fishing, I don't know, group policy, like the guy, <laughs> his name is Brooks Tanaka. And he, he told us that if we don't have regulations on fishing and certifications on, on fish stuff, um, most of the product that we get in New York is frozen. Like, not a lot of it is fresh. So if you're going to be cooking with um, tuna, just know that it's all re possibly already been frozen unless you know who caught it. Uh, there's no guarantee unless it's documented somewhere. Um, and he's t also told us that um, be careful uh, what businesses you support when it comes to buying fish because um, there are still companies out there that use um, that use slavery which is awful um, and it's not regulated so uh, make sure you're buying from trustworthy sources and uh, know where your fish comes from because you know if you don't know where it comes from a you don't know how it was caught um, or you know if, if bad labor was used and you don't know what that fish has been eating. So if it was in polluted water, um, you don't know that. So uh, make sure you know where your tuna is coming from. Yay. Oh, thanks, Lucius, for gifting a subscription to our community. Oh, that means we get... We get a, an, an emote here. Well, we get a pride pog. Aww. In my mind, it's always pride month, right? <laughs> Pride month is not over for me. Pride month is all year. <laughs> this is awesome. I actually don't play with these emotes. Oh, cuties. Oh, there's so many cute emotes. Oh, we unlocked so many. That's great. Thank you. Is there any other ways you guys like to eat tuna? Oh, I love these. These are great. Oh, of course we got Pikachu also. <laughs> Having fun in the chat. All right. So, let's put another egg on me. Egg. Omelet. Hi, omelet. I like you, omelet. <laughs> Oh, having fun in the chat. Yeah, you did get white tuna last week. This is why we started talking about tuna. Yeah. You inspired the tuna conversation. But right now, we are moving on to watercress that Lucia's mentioned. Um, now I know why you asked about it, because this is great. It's related to nasturtiums, which are very peppery, and I know you like peppery food. So, let's look at watercress. What does that look like? How many of you have had watercress? Let's take off this tuna photo. Here, we got some watercress here. We got some watercress here. This one's a better one. Oh, you got a whole tuna last week? Excuse me? Dang, dude. How big was it? I've eaten a half. I've eaten a half of a, of a tuna carcass with a spoon. 
Oh yeah, Lucia says, yay, watercress, I've always had it cooked, but only recently had it raw. Yeah, it can, it can be both. It can be raw and cooked. <laughs> oh, watercress is okay. Well, let me tell you all the things. Let me tell you. So watercress or yellowcress is a species of aquatic flowering plant in the cabbage family. Did you know that? It's a brassica. Um, so its botanical name is Nasturtium officinale. So it is related to those flat leaf nasturtiums that you might see in a garden patch. So watercress grows really fast. Um, it's native to Europe and Asia. So you might see it in Asian supermarkets. That's kind of where I discovered it. Um, it's one of the oldest known leaf vegetables consumed by humans. Um, so watercress has a lot of relatives like garden crust, mustard, radish, and wasabi, all known for their piquant flavors. And Lucius, this is for you. Um, so this nutrient-packed veggie has been tasked with treating everything from bad breath to blood disorders. So when Hippocrates found, founded the world's first hospital in 400 BC, he grew watercress outside for that purpose. Whoa, did you know that? So ancient Greeks believed eating watercress would make you witty, while Victorians thought it could get rid of freckles. Though I don't know why you would want to get rid of your freckles. They're beautiful. Um, so the hollow stems of watercress will float, which is really fascinating. Um, so when you're storing watercress, just like, um, you know, mimic its, its environment, you know, so store it in like a shallow thing of, of water so that uh, it'll stay fresh. Um, so it's well suited to hydroponics, so you might start seeing it in um, year round. So it's, it's usually in season, season from like April to September, but we might start seeing it in the winter because there's a lot of hydroponic um, type of farms that are, are starting in New York City, like Farm One and um, Brooklyn Grange are, are starting to do like more uh, year round cultivation of that kind of stuff. Um, so in the UK, watercress was first commercially cultivated in 1808 by a horticulturist named William Bradbury along the River Ebbsfleet in Kent. Um, in the 1940s, we go to the U.S., and Huntsville, Alabama was locally known as the watercress capital of the world. Didn't know that about Alabama. Um, so, the new tips of watercress leaves can be eaten raw or cooked, like we said earlier. It is 95% water. Does that sound familiar? It's kind of like us. You know, we're like 90-ish percent water, right? Right? Um... So it contains carbs, protein, fat, dietary fiber. 100 grams serving of raw watercress provides 11 calories, which is not a lot, but it has vitamins uh, K, uh, A, C, riboflavin, B6, calcium, and manganese. That's great. Um, so the taste, tastes kind of bright, fresh. Um, they can be a little bitter when they get too old, um, and it's peppery. Uh, what else? Uh, so the peppery taste comes from the mustard oil in the plant so it's a brassica so like broccoli cabbage they all have this sort of funky defense mechanism uh but in watercress's case it is a peppery defense mechanism uh so the young leaves have less mustard oil and a milder flavor so you can tell how old a watercress bunch is by like that measure of how spicy it is um yeah so there was a French chef in the 14th century named Talavant, Talavant, um, and he prepared, he's the first person ever to include it on a menu. He prepared a lavish banquet and served watercress after the first, after the fourth course, writing on the menu, watercress served alone to refresh the mouth. Kind of like a palate cleanser. Fascinating. Fascinating. Um, so it's not a good idea to eat watercress you find growing in the wild. So like, don't forage it, um, cause it might be com come from polluted water and remember that it's 95% water. And so that's all up in the leaves and stuff. Um, and wild watercress might also carry like liver fluke. So you could have like a fluke in your liver, which doesn't sound very fun. Um, so cultivated watercress is grown on like washed gravel and nourished with like pure fresh spring water. Uh, so make sure that is the case if you're if you are going foraging for it. Um, 
Yeah, let's see. It can last for up to a week in the fridge. Just remember, put it in like a shallow bowl of water like you're um, having a, you know, it's like a bouquet of flowers, you know. Uh, so how do we eat it? So in Germany, watercress is eaten with meat, sausages, and smoked fish. Um, you can have it with like sea trout, salmon, um, anything that's rich, you can cut that with some watercress. Uh, like we mentioned, you can have it in salad. Um, how many of you remember that movie or the book, The Witches? That Roald Dahl story, The Witches? So there, in the dining room, there's a scene where, where they're trying to poison the cress soup. And that's the watercress soup. Um, so, in France, cress soup is called potage de santé, or healthy soup. Uh, watercress is hearty enough for you to stir fry. It won't just like wilt like spinach. It'll still be a little crunchy. Um, you can have it in Korean banchan. This is actually one of my favorite ways to eat it. So you steam the watercress, press all the water out uh, when it's cold, uh, you know, wring it out like this, like a towel, and then slice that into sections and serve it cold with sesame oil and sesame seeds. Very simple, very good. You can add them to an omelet. You can switch out the L in a BLT, like so have a BWT, like a bacon watercress tomato sandwich. <laughs> you can put it on a pizza. Um, one of my other favorite ways to eat it is in hot pot, you know, like a big communal broth and then like putting the watercress uh, and dipping it in there. Oh, sounds so good. So anywhere that you would use like horseradish or wasabi or anything peppery, like a steak, sushi, citrus, like watercress will play nicely. Yeah. Yeah, watercress banchan, B-A-N-C-H-A-N. Mmm, watercress and tuna sandwich, yes. Yeah, that sounds great, doesn't it? Cool. That is watercress, my friends. What else do we have today? Today, so we're gonna talk about my pie journey. So like, I don't love baking. I only do it when I have to. <laughs> really don't love baking. Um, so pastry is, requires a lot of patience. It um, is temperamental. Yeah. And there are a lot of steps, but once you understand sort of the science behind it or like why you put so much labor into it, it, it does pay off. Like I showed you that pie at the beginning of the show that it was worth it to me, you know? So let's, let's look at some pie. Let's look at pie. That's a pie. That's a lattice. I'll tell you how we get those like crinkly edges there. Let's see what else here. These are standalone pies, so they can, you can see that the crust is strong enough to support the filling, and you can just pick it up and eat it. And then we have a covered, a fully covered pie. And then we have another type called a galette. So it doesn't use, it, it is using a tin, but generally you're not supposed to use a tin with galette, you just fold the excess pie crust over the edges and then bake that which I kind of prefer. It's like less work to make a galette. But we're here to talk about pie crust. So what about? So the, there's a big difference between flaky pastry pie crust and crumb crust like you're gonna get on a cheesecake. So I'm only gonna talk about flaky pastry pie crust, very specifically. Um, so pie, it can be sweet or savory. I prefer savory, but that's me. Um, there are a few different types, like I just showed you. There's the filled pie, which is a single crust or a bottom crust. So this is what you would call, let's see, where is it? This is a filled pie. Yes. Has pastry lining the baking dish and the filling is placed on top um, and the pastry is left open. Oh wait, no, I'm sorry. The galette is closer to that. Yeah, that's left open. So this is a filled pie. And then next is a top crust pie. That's the one I was getting confused about here. Top crust. So there's crust bottom and top. 
and two crust pie. We have the standing pie. So it has fully enclosed bottom and top. And these are two different thicknesses to enclose it. Interesting. So let's unselect all these. Okay. So uh, short crust pastry is a, you know, uh, it's used for pie crust, um, but many things can be used in short crust. Um, I mean, short crust can be used for other things like biscuits. Um, no, 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 I'm sorry. Rewind, rewind, rewind. So in the pie world, you know, you're not just limited to the flaky pastry pie dough and the crumb dough. You can also use like crushed up cookies. You can use mashed potato as like a bottom layer and like breadcrumbs. So there are things that you, like you can even do pretzels. It's crazy. But uh, again, I'm only gonna talk about pastry. Um, the source of the word pie uh, might be from magpie. So like the bird magpie. So those birds are known for collecting odds and ends in the nest so that, you know, you're collecting all these things into a pie. Dunno. Uh, medieval pies also contained many different animal meats, including chickens, crows, pigeons, and rabbits. So it might be from that, like magpie pie. Ugh. So for, in the year 1450, there's a recipe for great pies, G-R-E-T-E, P-Y-E-S, pies. Um, yeah. Uh, la 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 la, there's a long list of animals that are inside the great pie. So Charles Perry says odds and ends including beef, beef suet, capons, hens, mallards, teal ducks, rabbits, woodcocks, large birds such as herons, storks, beef marrow, hard cooked eggs, dates, raisins, and prunes. Yo, <laughs> that's a lot of animals. <laughs> that's crazy. Um,. So pies came from this need for nutritious, easy to store, easy to carry, long lasting foods on long journeys, um, particularly at sea. Um, so this was, this is why like on ships or like in pirate movies, you see there's a cook with like lots of live food because they're butchering it on the boat because there's no way to store it if they kill it before the ship leaves the dock, you know, like there's no refrigeration. Um, so they keep the live animals there with the cook. Insane. Um, so ancient Greeks are believed to have originated pie pastry in the plays of Aristophanes, 5th century BC. There are mentions of sweetmeats, including small pastries filled with fruit. Um, interesting. Uh, Greeks certainly recognize the trade of pastry cooked as a distinct from that of a baker. I could, I could see that distinction. Um, first century Roman cookbook, Apicus makes various mentions of recipes that involve a pie case. By 160 BC, Roman statesman Marcus Port Portius Cato um, notes the recipes for the most popular pie cake is called placenta. Oh my god, why? Oh god, why? Sorry. Eee. Eee. Um, wealthy Romans combined many types of meats in their pies, including mussels and other seafoods. Roman pie makers generally used vegetable oil, such as olive oil, to make their dough instead of butter. Interesting. Earliest pie-like recipes refer to coffins. <laughs> it's a word actually used for basket or box. Um, wow. Wow. Open top pies were referred to as traps, like a bear trap. This is amazing. <laughs> Um, back in the day, the resulting hardened pastry was not necessarily eaten, so its function was just to contain the filling for cooking and store it. Wow, so edible, edible pastry was more of like a later thing. Wow. Uh, <laughs> interesting. Oh, so medieval pie crusts were often baked first to create a pot of baked dough with a removable top crust, hence the expression pot pie. Oh, that's great. So pies in the 1400 included birds, like songbirds, oh my god. Uh, at the coronation of eight-year-old King Henry VI, um, Patrick and Peacock, oh my god, Partridge and Peacock pie were served. <laughs> that sounds terrible. <laughs> oh my god. 
Oh, the expressions eat crow and four and 20 blackbirds are sayings from the era when crow and blackbirds were eaten in pies. Oh my gosh. Um, until the start of the 15th century, pies were expected co to contain meat or fish. The 15th century custard and fruit pies began uh, appearing and um, often with dried fruit like dates and raisins. Oh my goodness. Um, the first fruit pies recorded in late 16th century when Queen, Queen Elizabeth I was served cherry pie. Wow, the first fruit pie was cherry. Goodness. Interesting. Uh, the largest pies of the era were called standing pies, like the one I showed you. Um, they're baked with steam holes and then sealed with melted butter. Mmm, mmm. But then eaten over several months? No way. <laughs> Can you imagine eating a pie for a month? How large would it have to be? <laughs> wow. Um, there was like some weird like 1870s backlash against pies. There was like, here's our new science of nutrition, because it's full of butter, right? There was a woman named Sarah Tyson Rohrer. She was a cooking teacher and food editor who warned the public about how much energy pies take to digest. That's hilarious. She, she states that all pie crusts are to be condemned, and her cookbook only included apple tart, jelly, and meringue-covered crackers, pate, and a hygienic pie, which had apple slices or a pumpkin custard baked in a biscuit dough. Very anti-pie rhetoric. Um, in 1866, Harper Magazine included an article by C.W. Gesner that stated, Although we cry for pie when we are infants, pie kills us finally, as the heavy crust cannot be digested. Wow. Such anti-pie sentiment. Friends, I am not here to spread <laughs> pie pop propaganda. <laughs> maybe the red from cherries reminded them of blood. Maybe, maybe. Uh, Lucius is slowly working on strawberry rhubarb pie, but you keep it in the fridge. Yeah, pie is a lot. I only can eat like one slice, you know? Um, so, dealing with pie crust, this is like the whole reason why I'm talking about it. So when you're working with ready-made crust, like even if you are buying it from the store, it comes frozen and it needs to stay cold, as cold as possible. So I've read like many many recipes and there are things that a few chefs do to like keep everything as cold as possible so besides like putting the mixture in the fridge like after every step you can also chill the mixing bowl like as metal bowls get really really cold um you can chill the tools so um chef angela dimiyuga says chill the bowl with the flour so the flour gets cold um, Nicole Taylor says to chill the tools, so your your uh, pastry cutter, um, your whisk, whatever it is that you're using to cut the butter, um, chill that. Chill the ice water that you're going to be mixing into it. Um, chill the butter, the lard, or the vegetable shortening. So if it calls for a stick of butter, you're going to cube it. At first, you're going to cube it like solid and then put it back in the fridge so that um, you can easily like break off the pieces but not handle it as much. Um, that's really, really important when it comes to like the fat of the pie crust because you can't unmelt butter once it's touching other things. So if you had butter in a bowl and it was getting soft, you can quickly put that in the freezer for 10 minutes and it will become solid again. But once it's touching flour, you can't separate flour molecules from butter. It's just really tough. So that's why it's super important to keep everything cold when you're dealing with pie crust. Um, yeah, and so once I roll my pie crust out and it's like come together into the batter, um, I put that in the, fr in the freezer for like five minutes and then try to work on it again, shape it again, and then put it in the freezer. So handling it the least with your hands, um, y yeah, you try to like not touch it as much because your hands are warm. Kind of like when you're holding a white wine glass by the stem or like the foot instead of the bulb. Because you hold a red wine glass by the bulb, so your, the warmth from your hands opens up the aromas. You don't really want to do that with white, white wine. Um, so same thing with pie crust. You don't want to like put your hands all over it. Um, so when you're mixing pie crust, start by mixing the dry ingredients together. So that's usually the flour and the salt. Just so that you make sure the salt is is distributed throughout the flour. Like, you don't want to bite into a pie crust and have, like, one glob of salt. Too much. Um, so there are several ways to add that cold butter. Um, you can pebble it in the food processor. 
So like pulse it in the food processor. You don't want to put it on high because as soon as you start whipping that butter, it's going to create heat in there. So just like only bursts in the food processor to create pebbles. You can also, you can still do this by hand, um, but you have to work really quickly. So like I have this method of like pinching the butter cubes into the flour. Um, you can also use a rolling pin, like, like hit them a little bit and then roll it into the flour so that your hands don't touch it. You can use a cold pastry cutter, which kind of looks like a whisk brass knuckles. Like I don't have a photo of it, but if you Google like pastry cutter, you, you hold it one hand and you like cut the butter into the flour or you can use two knives and just do this into the butter. Um, and you can also use a dough scraper, which is, um, I have one here. I'll show you. Yeah, dough scrapers. You know, instead of like picking up dough with your hands, you can just like use this to like, it's like a spatula, but with dough. <laughs> oh yeah, cold stone is also a great approach too. Yes. Yeah. Um, and it's okay when, you know, when you're working with pie crust, like the butter doesn't have to completely blend in because those butter chunks, I mean, I, I would flatten them completely, but they don't have to be like a uniform dough because those butter chunks make it flaky. You know, that's like the flakiness. Um, so the way you get these crimpy edges on this lattice pie is, um, is a pastry roller. So it looks like a mini uh, pizza wheel or pizza slicer, but it's crimped. So you, all you do is like run it over the dough. For me, when I was working on my pie, look, let's go back to my, uh, let's see, where's my pie here? Nope, that's not the pie. Is it this one? No. Where's the pie? I don't remember. Oh boy. Gonna keep looking for the pie. Nope, that's not a pie. That's not a pie. There we go. Look at that. So for me, I didn't use a pastry cutter. I didn't use a pizza slicer. I used a knife and a measuring tape. <laughs> just to keep that straight edge. You can also um, buy a ruler just for baking so you can get these straight edges. So what I did first for making a lattice was I rolled out the dough. I used a rolling pen. Um, you know, I was rolling out the butter. I put that in the fridge for 10 minutes. And then when it was like this, this texture of like a, a uniform pastry, you can see sort of on the right, um, there's some like white spots and that's like the butter. Like I, I left big chunks of butter in it. Um, so I rolled it out into one sheet and then cut lines with my, my knife and my, my measuring tape. And then uh, put that in the fridge and then got my, my pan ready and then did the horizontal, the lines horizontal first, space them out like a centimeter, and then lift up. So if I number these, so from the top going down, one, two, three, four, five, I lift up like, so it's attached here on the, on the, the circular dots here on the left, it's attached. Like, so I've, I've crimped it to the edge of the pan. So I lift number one, three and five, you know, over the edge and then shimmy the vertical one in. I fold them back and then fold two and four out over the, over the edge and then shimmy another vertical one. And so I repeat this like, you know, weaving. And then all you do to close it is like pinch the dough over the, over the edges. And then you cut all the overhang off of it. So it's not very complicated. Uh, my friend, um, Erin Clarkson, who is on Instagram as Cloudy Kitchen, she has so many good like pie tutorials. She does like overhead so you can watch how, how the pattern is made. So this is my very, very, very first lattice. So you can do this too. Absolutely, you can do this too. And you can cover up your mistakes with more pastry. So like that left side with all the dots, that's the edge where I made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> you just put more pastry on top of it. <laughs>
<gasps> yellow <laughs> you can do braids you can do cutouts so if you have cookie cutters I don't I wouldn't recommend cookie cutters that have um etched patterns I would do like solid shape cookie cutters so I only have circular ones but you could do like leaves or like hearts or whatever other shape you want um you don't even have to do lattice you could just do all dots of, of circles just overlapped here and just let the um the stuff bubble up from the bottom like how cute would that be um and then after this so after you're done decorating i put it back in the fridge to chill one more time so it's solid uh, we want to keep that butter cold um you do a brush of egg wash over it and then yeah you do a brush of egg wash and then you bake it and a trick to getting an even um, brownness on pie crust is doing the foil um, crown. So because you've wiped it with egg wash, it is a sticky pastry situation. So you don't want to put the foil on it. Like you want to tent it over the edges so that the edges don't burn while you're cooking. So the middle of the pie is going to take the longest to brown. So you want to do like a little like crown of foil over the edges, but not touching the pastry so it doesn't stick to it. That's a little t tricky. <laughs> I can tell you now it's a little tricky. Um, but if you can do it, you know, you will have an even, even browning. So maybe 20 minutes after you started baking, you can take off that foil crown and then it will brown the rest of it. See, look, I've done it. My first, my first lattice pie. Hooray. <laughs> Prop pie ganda. Hi, Adam. <laughs> yes, very geometrical. You can do these diagonally. You don't even have to do like the, you know, perpendicular cross hatching. You can do all sorts of things. You can just do lines one way. You don't even have to lattice it. Yeah. Or you could just do the slab, you know, just a quarter inch thick slab and just make sure you cut a few holes in it so that it, the pie can, uh, the pie filling can bubble up. Braiding, yes, you can still do braiding, but I would, um, so I would cut the dough and then chill that for 10 minutes, braid it, chill that for 10 minutes, and then put that either on an edge or as one of the larger strips across the pie. But I would just remember to keep chilling it between steps. So if you, as soon as you start feeling that it's like too, sto too soft, like put it in the fridge. Yeah, two holes on top. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's about right. Just need to, like, you just need a vent. Yeah. What are your guys' favorite pies? I am a huge fan of uh, banana cream. I like a pumpkin pie during the holidays. I like a cherry pie. I don't know what kind of what kind of pies you y'all like. Meat pie. Oh yes, a meat pie. Oh, what kind of pie did I make? Yes, a shepherd's pie is a pie. Yes, that is using mashed potato as as your crust. Ice box. Oh my gosh, I haven't had an ice box in so long. Sweet potato. Yeah. Oh man, y'all, I want pie. <laughs> I want more pie. This pie you're looking at is um, a, like a lengua beef tongue pie. It was really good. Ooh, you got an apple pie to get today? Does it have crust on the bottom and top or just only on the bottom? Love it. I like that we have um, these adorable chat emoji now. Okay. Slab crust, oh, on top and bottom, noise. Chicago deep dish, technically a pie, I guess. Different dough though, we're talking about pie, pastry pie crust. Sometimes they have a lattice on top, but not today. Oh, nice. All this pie talk is making me hungry. All right, friends, we've gotten to the part of the stream where we're gonna pretend we're on Chopped. So mental exercise time, friends. I'm gonna put an egg on me while we do this. Let's start um, shouting out some ingredients. We need like four. 
four ingredients in the chat and let's try to mash them up and come up with dishes together. Be really fun. Or three ingredients, you know, we don't have to do four. So everyone can participate. Just name an ingredient in the chat and we'll try to come up with ways to combine all three ingredients. Just exercise in uh, thinking about what is possible with food. It's one of my favorite things. Chef goat cheese, number one. All right, thank you, Martin. What else, friends? Cod, okay, cod, good choice. One more. LT, you got something? Or Adam? Just need one more ingredient. So, Chev, let's talk about that. Goat cheese. Your fridge is empty and you're hungry. Oh, pickled red onions. Great. Okay, let's start with that. So we have goat cheese, codfish, and pickled red onions. So goat cheese generally is two weeks old. It can be fresh. Um, it's usually very, very soft, but you can get some varieties that are a little older and aged. So there's lots of aged goat cheese that are aged for like two weeks. So like Loire Valley cheeses, there's Ashrine cheeses, there's even goat Gouda, like so uh, like harder, like cheddar like goat cheeses. So don't think of goat cheese as just the like the only the white stuff. There's also goat cheddar, there's also goat Gouda um, and stuff like that. So codfish, um, it's like, you know, the general white fish. It can be flaked, it can be filleted, it can be made into fish sticks, it can be made into fish cakes, it can be made into a salad, it can be deep fried. Um, we have pickled red onions, which are delicious. Um, pickles generally stand up to fried things. So what can we do here? Smashing up goat cheese, cod, and red onions. Let's say a battered codfish taco with red onions. <laughs> filet fish Yes, a fancy filet fish with goat cheese. Sounds lovely. Can you imagine on a squishy potato bun with like a crunchy codfish filet? A whipped goat cheese instead of mayo and some pickled red onion? That sounds nice and doable. Yeah, of course we're going to sandwich root. Yeah, duh. Um, so there's a fish salad called a brandade, which uh, is flaked cod, um, aioli, which is like a garlicky mayonnaise, um, potato. Ooh, you can do blackened cod, yes. We could do Cajun too. We could do like a po' boy. Yeah, po' boy with pickled onion. Yum. We could do like pickled onion rings with a goat cheese dip. That sounds lovely. We could do a cod pate and then do like a banh mi style sandwich with it with the pickled onion. Like so banh mi has pickled carrot. So just add some cilantro there and some daikon radish with a fish pate. Oh, that sounds nice. Um, we could do fish balls with the cod. We could have a soup. How to do, how to add the goat cheese to that though. We could do an open face toast with the goat cheese and pickled onions. So like not using the fish at all would be a fun thing to do. You can also deep fry goat cheese. I've had that before. Mmm. Blackened cod on a tostada with like, if we, if we diluted the goat cheese with some heavy cream and made it into like a sour crema situation, like cod tostada would be good. How about pasta? Is there anything pasta wise we can do? 
You do a cold, a cold pasta with uh, marinated goat cheese, uh, oil cured cod, pickled onion. We could use the brine from the pickled onion to um, make sort of like a ceviche with the cod. Orzo, yeah, orzo's great. Yeah, orzo and goat cheese is good together. Grilled goat cheese cod, mmm. Oh, you could do like a stuffed like fish burger of sorts, you know? So if we had like bottom half of like a, a cod burger and then like put a little goat cheese in the middle and then more fish and then bread that and make a burger. Yeah. Take some white rice, press in a hamburger bun, and put some fried cod, pickled onion, and cheese on it. Hell yeah. I like that. These are all good ideas. Giant or an onigiri with cod and goat cheese inside. Hell yeah. Yum. Yes. So thinking about like smorgasbord, like charcuterie, we could do... We could roll all the chev into to balls and then marinate that in some like garlic oil. Make like um like a fish sausage. We can make a fish sausage and serve that with some crackers. On uh, uh yeah yeah. These are all great. I like this. Okay, these are all great ideas. Ooh, we could do like pancakes. With like goat cheese and the pickled onions. Pickled cod and fried goat cheese. Yeah. Ooh, switching the methods. So taking the pickle from the onion and pickling the cod with it. Yeah. Great idea. Man, y'all are getting good at this. This makes me so happy, you know that? Hey, is Fitz Murphy in the chat? Because Fitz Murphy uh, requested that we also talk about that show Dark. Have all, are any of you watching that show, Dark? I've, I watched all of season three over the weekend. <laughs> so I will not post any spoilers. I will not say any spoilers. Anyone who's, ever, who's seen it, don't post any spoilers. But I will generally talk about this show. Yeah, Dark is a um, German Netflix show that is kind of... It's like better than Stranger Things. It's like about time travel. And it's like a lot of like untangling which character is whose mother you know like there's a lot of like there's a big family tree in this show so it's really fun to like try to understand who who, who is who who is that <laughs> yeah stranger things meets donnie darko yeah it's great um so no spoilers if you if you've seen it don't you know whatever but uh for those of you who have seen it like why do you like it um some of the motifs that i find interesting from it are like objects persisting through time time itself um the effort to break cycles and like perpetuating it um generally the thought is like incest is bad <laughs> yes incest is bad there's a whole thing about like dark versus light like the show is called dark um there's a character um named marta she uh looks like rachel white like her name is lisa vicari but she looks like rachel white and i am advocating for a lisa vicari and rachel white's like heist movie in the future how dope would that be they look alike i'm sorry <laughs> um how often do I watch Food Network? I don't. I don't watch Food Network anymore. It's because I don't have cable. I, I don't really sit and watch a lot of things. I watch more like fiction stuff. I did grow up watching a lot of Food Network. I put in my time for sure. Like I watched all of Good Eats. I watched a lot of Ina Garten and Giada. Um, I've only become fond of Guy Fieri only recently and because i've met him he is the nicest he's the nicest person uh what else fitz murphy if you're not in here <laughs> you're the one that requested this segment <laughs> well i will tweet at you later about it anyway i recommend this show uh if you like uh 
sci-fi time travel stuff. Anyone else have any questions about the stuff we talked about today? Tuna, watercress, and, and pie crust? Dope. Well, next time, next Wednesday, I'll be back to talk about food again. And I will happily take your suggestions now or later on Twitter. Uh, whatever, there is no rush. Uh, the queue is open for you. Uh, I will be back also on Sunday at 12 p.m. Eastern to talk about zines. We're going to go over Put an Egg on It, Issue 13. And I haven't picked the other magazines yet. I don't know if I want to do the Food and Wine Thanksgiving yet. It's a big issue. <laughs> uh, yeah. So if you have any questions about cooking or food, feel free to tweet me. Randwiches. Have I covered cured meat yet? No, I have not. I'll write that down. Cured meats. Might need more suggestions from, from food from the Asian market. Have you played with daikon radish yet? It's a lot of food. A daikon radish is like the length of my arm. Have we done tomatoes? We have not done tomatoes. Let's do tomatoes. They're in season. Anyone else? Does anyone have any suggestions for our friend in the chat uh, for food from the Asian market? I already suggested Lao Gan Ma. Uh, we talked about Gai Lan last week. Oh, you have two types of tomato in your CSA? Dang. That's great. I can't wait to see it. Please send a photo. All right, friends. It's time for me to wrap up. So if you want, to, you want to suggest another ingredient or like a cooking technique that you want to learn about, go ahead and tweet me. Um, I like you. Thanks for hanging out. Good to see y'all. I hope that you have a good rest of your week. And please send me your photos, your cooking photos. I'd love to feature it here on the stream and tag you and, and shout out and be proud of you. I like being proud of you and your cooking. <laughs> Thanks for the support. Thanks for sharing subscriptions with other people, Lucius. That was very nice of you. Um, everybody else, I like you. Happy Wednesday. Hope to see you again on Sunday at 12. All right. Bye.